Hello everyone. Welcome to marktechpros.com's AI industry talk. And today we have a very special guest, uh, Dr. Ashutosh Saxena. Dr. Saxena is the founder and CEO of Casper AI that builds AI enabled homes for senior and luxury housing. Dr. Saxena received his PhD in 2009 in computer science from Stanford University with Andrew Ng. He was an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at Cornell University. At Cornell, he also founded RoboBrain, a joint venture between Stanford, Berkeley, Brown, and Cornell to develop a knowledge engine that allows robots to learn from internet videos and share their learning in the physical world with each other. He has over 12,000 citations in the area of artificial intelligence with numerous awards, including SF Business Times 40 Under 40, TR35 Innovator Award by MIT Technology Review, and many more in the list. So with this, I would like to invite Ashutosh to marktechpost.com. Welcome, Ashutosh. Hello, thanks for the introduction. So tell us about your journey in machine learning and computer vision, starting from IIT to Stanford. At IIT, I was working uh, with Amitabha Mukherjee on a couple of uh, projects like isomorphic mapping, a isomorphic paper, which takes a high dimensional data point into a low dimensional nonlinear subspace. That's where I started. And when I joined Stanford, I met Andrew Ng, where we built on a, uh, we, we talked about a very interesting problem, which is given a single still image, can you take that image and compute a 3D model out of it? So we built uh, deep learning methods to be able to do that, which has huge applications in robotics as well as computer graphics. Another area that we touched was uh, for robots to do household course and, and course in industrial environments, can we, can we, instead of programming the robots manually, can we, can we come up with a learning algorithm that robots can watch and learn from the large amount of data so we developed these techniques where by looking at large amounts of 3D data and image data, robots can do interesting things. For example, unload items from a dishwasher. So I continued that work uh, at Cornell and uh, built robots that can do things like, uh, uh, if you ask the robot, hey, can a robot make me a latte? Uh, so you can go one step further and we were able to design machine learning algorithms that can basically go online and learn from a large amount of data. For example, YouTube, WikiHow, Wikipedia, make a knowledge graph for all this information. Um, and this allowed the robot to do some interesting things. For example, in this video, you will see the person So it can basically take the natural language instruction, figure out what is going on in the environment and do a very complicated task of making a recipe as we are seeing in the video. So I, I learned uh, with Andrew Ng and at Cornell at my RoboBrain lab, how can large amounts of data be used to develop supervised or unsupervised uh, methodologies that robots can use to do complicated tasks like, like this. So moving, moving forward with your story uh, uh, from IIT to Stanford to the next uh, thing, which is your venture, Casper AI. Tell us about your venture, Casper AI, and the problems you are trying to address through it. What I realized while developing robots using AI at Stanford and at Cornell was that we were doing it for helping people in the first place, whether it is families or seniors. Uh, because in the homes, people spend actually 68% of their lives in a home. And well, recently that, that percentage has increased above 90% because of the pandemic. Um, so the idea was, can we take these AI technologies and apply them in the homes directly? So we started thinking of the homes as a robot itself. So rather than thinking of a robot going inside the home, we, we considered this home, which has about 50 to 100 devices on the right hand side. And we, we, we figured out if we could control these different devices in the home, such as the shades, sensors, cameras, uh, cleaning robots inside the home, appliances, then we can really build a new computing platform and substantially improve things that we can do for people. That is why I, together with David Sheraton, who is the co-founder of Casper.ai. He is one of the first three investors of Google and his last company was Arista Networks. 
we together founded this company with the goal of taking a home and applying AI technologies to build a lot of application for people. For example, uh, let me describe a little bit further more. In this home, you have a variety of sensors. So the home can figure out what people are doing in the morning. It can turn on the lights. It can sense when people reach the kitchen area. Uh, all the sensor data is fed into a deep learning algorithm, which can know which location people are, which is in the bottom middle picture. And it can also figure out a lot of health applications. For example, seniors uh, find it really helpful if a home reminds them that they have to drink more water or certain incidents, for example, falling down. So what we have done uh, here is that we have taken these technologies and built apartment complexes. For example, this apartment complex has about 10,000 devices which are controlled by our AI. And we are applying and adding further things, for example, medication robots and cleaning robots to this equation. But let me show you in a video what these technologies can, are, are doing for the people living in this home in this particular video. So in this video, what you're seeing uh, is that uh, people are living in these houses uh, this is in Las Vegas and people can do a lot of things. For example, they want to stay healthy and the home is opening the curtains to show motivation, to give motivation to the people. So they get up in the morning, uh, they are motivated and they are exercising. So this home really helps people in living a healthy living. Forgetfulness is a problem for elderly. They can be cooking, but they may leave the stove on, forget about it and go to sleep. This is dangerous for them as well as for the property. So the home tries to remind them by turning on the lights in red, maybe even sounding an alarm. Uh, so this home is acting as a companion robot and managing their lifestyle. And these are small things. Sometimes residents also face many incidents which are challenging for their health and safety. For example, there are issues uh, such as falling down. In this case, the home can detect uh, that the person has fallen down and they are inactive and it, can gi it gives an alert to the on-site staff who can come and help the resident in this case. So this is, these are some of the examples of the, so how software and AI driven software is changing the lives for the people in many apartment complexes across the US and Japan. That's really great. Uh, amazing it is because uh, seeing the current situation with the pandemic, uh, COVID-19, uh, this could be really uh, like a boost uh, for people, especially elderly population, as well as for, for millennials, because nowadays everyone is working from home. So this could be really helpful for all of us uh, if, if this kind of technology is, is being implemented in, in most of the apartments. So that's really cool. But that brings up my third question where uh, the robotics sector is seeing a rising importance of big data and AI. How do you see these emerging technologies impacting the smart homes of the future? I think in the smart home space, the um, robotics and AI are going to play a huge impact. Uh, and the reason is um, AI has automated many other areas of living, for example, going from one place to another. Like for example, a simple software can actually change how people travel instead of taking a taxi, they take ride sharing. They have changed how people access information on the internet. How do they talk to each other? These are a lot of applications. Now, if you come to homes, um, this is the place which is a huge opportunity because people spend two thirds of their life in the home and the application of software in these areas is very minimal. Uh, we use our homes for many purposes, for taking a nice sleep, for resting, waking up in the morning, uh, spending time with our family and children, taking a breakfast for entertainment. There are incidents that I mentioned that happened in the house, for example, falling down. Uh, there is energy maintenance. There is safety of the building itself. So there are a lot of different applications which are untouched. So far in the market, we are seeing piecemeal approach to this problem. People are building these box solutions, for example, a thermostat or a speaker, 
And these are consumer devices which people are trying to use. Now, if you flip it around and think of it from a robotics and AI data-driven technique method, you are suddenly having tens of thousands of devices in a building, like about 50 to 100 in a single apartment. Um, you can basically sense a lot of things. You can actuate a lot of things. We have a lot of robots that are there to help. We have the cleaning robot, which can clean your floor. You can start thinking of the refrigerator, dishwasher, and a stove as a robot. Dishwasher is essentially doing something to the dishes. There are other robots that are coming into picture, for example, telepresence robots and medicine delivery robots. And all these functionalities, once they work together with the AI, can substantially transform how people expect to live in the apartments. And these are not even too much costly. All of the things that I'm describing, we are providing to the residents at the cost of an iPhone, which is about the one month rent of the apartment. Um, so there is a huge opportunity in smart homes, how robotics and AI are going to transform the next generation homes that people live in. And this is also all driven by data driven techniques and machine learning algorithms. Once you have that much data, you have, we have to develop new techniques on how to piece together data from variety of sources. So you may be getting data from motion sensor, from switches, from a cleaning robot, from a door lock, and one has to piece it all together to figure out the context in which the users are operating in the activities they are doing in order to be able to help them. And this is not an easy goal for the AI. What we are really talking about is making a Jarvis or a Butler-like AI which can accompany you and not just verbally, but actually, actually doing things inside the home that you are looking and in which you are living. And this brings forward the need of innovations in AI technologies and not just on sensing or image recognition, but on natural language processing, robotics, uh, and physically embodied systems. Uh, that brings up to my next question. Uh, how do you maintain security and privacy with Casper uh, AI? A great point. Uh, in Southern California, I will let you know our building is coming live in Los Angeles this July. And the way we design these buildings, uh, including the one in Vegas, LA, Tokyo, and so on, is not by a cloud-based IoT approach. Traditional thinking is you have an internet of things device, um, IOT device, and the cloud collects all the data and then processes it to do some learning and then sends an information back to the devices to do. Um, this has problems because you are sending residential data to the cloud, uh, which in today's times, while we are expecting AI to do more and more things, I think this is too much information for the cloud service providers, such as these big companies um, in this space. In comparison to that, at Casper, we take a very different approach. Uh, we have a local distributed AI system. What that means is that instead of sending the data upstream to the cloud, our AI is a distributed AI that runs locally on the devices. So essential key compo component of this uh, system is a compiler that we call it is a distributed AI compiler. It takes all the AI algorithms that I described uh, uh, just now, for example, natural language processing, uh, speech to text, text to speech, uh, motion sensor detection, fall detector, sound classifiers, uh, alerts, for example, a stove left on. It takes all these things, compiles them into a form of a graph, and this graph is implemented locally into the IoT structure. What that means is you're not sending the data to the cloud. All the sensitive data stays local, it stays on the devices. The decisions are made locally. So you get the best of both worlds. You can still have learning and AI, but without sacrificing the privacy of the system. There is a, another benefit of this approach. In this case, because the devices themselves are not connected to the cloud, it is easier to enforce industry standard security. If you have 10,000 devices all connected to the internet, there are 10,000 ports on which a hacker can target them. But instead of that, you have a one heavily managed link to the building and everything else is local. Then security is also easier to manage in this approach. 
And which is why when we work with builders across the different countries, uh, the builders like this kind of local AI approach because, because it satisfies the GDPR and CCPA regulations. Uh, we are actually ahead of those regulations in the way we maintain security and privacy. That is really good to, for the general public because that gives a lot of confidence for the people to use uh, this type of technologies and be assured that everything is secured with best, best practices. So my next question would be, uh, what advice would you give to the startup CEOs who want to use machine learning to improve their business? I would say there are two considerations that come, become very important. Uh, the first one is applies to everyone. Doesn't matter if you are doing AI or machine learning, which is to put the users first. One really needs to not take a hammer and find the nail. Uh, one needs to understand what the users want. And machine learning is a technology that can help address many of the problem. Now it turns out that there is a huge opportunity because machine learning can learn automatically many things. So it does become a very useful tool for building many successful products for startup CEOs or product management. The second thing which is very unique to machine learning uh, or AI in general is the way it makes mistakes. Uh, so if you think about traditional software or hardware products, they go through a quality testing process. And once you make the product, it operates in a very deterministic fashion. Uh, you have a pen, to use the pen, you would open the cap and write with the pen. That's the pen as a product. You got a cell phone, um, you would press a few buttons, it would operate in a certain way. It is very de deterministic. Now, as the products become more complex because they operate in the real world, one starts using AI and machine learning and they have a certain style of failure. And this is where many companies and products have a problem because people are not used to a changing behavior of the software on the back in which it gives different answers to different purposes. And one advice I want to give is that people uh, and startup CEOs who want to build these AI based products is to be cognizant of this limitation and design the products which have this understanding of the way a product would fail. Now to elaborate further, Think about a image search on the internet. Uh, even if machine learning gives seven out of 10 good image results, it's a good outcome because you are serving the purpose of uh, uh, finding seven product images on the internet by doing an, a search. On the other hand, if you, have, if you were trying to make an autonomous driving car or a plane, your error requirement is very, very different. You're talking about six or even seven nines to be able to build a product. So that is where choosing what product to build is very useful. For example, in a car, uh, to build a assistive parking system which gives warning has a slightly lower perfection requirement. I mean, even if you uh, warned 99.9% .9 of the time, it is still okay. Same things go in a home. In an example at Casper, when we build this fall or inactivity detector, we do not pretend that it will work perfectly all the time. Instead of being prescriptive, we try to make a suggestive product, which is uh, there is on-site staff who is caretaking and taking care of the elderly on the site. We do not say, oh, the uh, 98 people are fine and two people have fallen down. We give them a priority list and a recommendation list of uh, what is going on so they can still manage the expectations through um, uh, context on site. So my next question would be, can you name some books uh, vid and videos that have influenced your thoughts the most? Really many people are a fan uh, of Isaac Asimov. So, so am I, I uh, grew up reading about the robots and the thinking that he was having, uh, especially the three laws of robotics and many of the other robotics books. Uh, more recently, I find um, a book called uh, Refresh or Hit Refresh by Satya Nadella. That is, that is very good on how, how, do you are, how, how should one think about rethinking and redesigning concepts um, in, in today's world. Um, and 
another book that I read in the from a fiction point of view is a, by an author called Werner Winch. He talks about a lot of automation and how software can manage the society in a very interesting manner. The last question uh, to you would be like, what are your thoughts about marktechpost.com? I think uh, when it comes to technology and uh, news or business, there is usually a gap. Uh, uh, people develop and do some core research uh, and a very narrow part of it is often visible in the news outlets. Uh, what I liked about Market Tech Post is that it takes a more grounded approach to this problem where they go in depth about the different technologies, especially AI and machine learning, and try to bring forward um, the mechanics and how does it really impact the world in a bit more detail. Uh, I think such news outlets which try to connect the research and, and the real world are very useful. So thank you so much. And this concludes the interview. And uh, we, we are really thankful to you, Ashitosh, and we wish you all the best with your venture. And we look forward to, you know, like interviewing uh, your team and cover your stories. And I personally feel like I would definitely uh, hop into this thing as soon as it's launched in Southern California. Thank you. Thanks for the interview. Thank you.